All right, welcome again to Discovery Church. Make some noise if you're excited to be in church today. Yeah, I'm excited that you guys are here. We're in part three of our generous series where we're learning, I hope you're learning, that, that generosity has more to do with like God's nature being revealed in our life and us walking in the spirit then we kind of realize because a lot of us love Jesus and we have Jesus but he just ain't coming out of us in situations other things are coming out of us there's no avenues for Jesus to be reflected and revealed in our relationships and in our life and the reason why is geez we're just not being generous with our time our talents and our treasures and it's actually through those three avenues that that God is revealed in our life. The character of God, the core characteristic of God is generosity. I'm really excited today because uh, we're having a guest speaker join us for the close out this generosity series as we lead into Christmas at Discovery. He's actually someone who's never spoken on a Sunday before. He's spoken to our leaders. He's, he's been a part of Discovery's journey since the very beginning. He's actually an overseer, one of our elders of Discovery Church, uh, but never on has spoken on a Sunday, so we're, I'm so excited for you to hear him today because he's been in my life from the very beginning, starting Discovery Church. He is like one of the big reasons why I attribute it to him, the, the success of and the health of Discovery, why we've been able to see so many people saved and grow and maintain healthy and still stay healthy as we grow was because I had a pastor in my life who was a mentor and a coach that I can call. He's like, he had... He started a church from like nothing, church planted as well, but now it's like multi-site, multinational, thousands of members across all kinds of states and stuff. So I'd be able to call him and say, Pastor Chris, what did you do when this happened? What about this stage and how here? And he's just been so tremendously helpful. And he's an amazing, he's an amazing friend. He's an amazing elder of Discovery Church. Um, and I'm so excited to you guys be blessed by him as well. So I want to, hear, I want to introduce him. You guys are going to give the best ovation for this man. Amen. Come on, Pastor Chris Songson. Give it up for him. Come on. Love you, buddy. <laughs> Love you, dude. That was awesome. Thank you. Good morning. How's everybody doing today? That was an amazing introduction. I was back there going, who's he talking about? He sounds good. Um, but it is awesome to be able to be with you guys and what a joy it is to be here. Stand with me real quick. Let's jump right into the message. Uh, and it is awesome to be with you. I'm sure you know as well as I know that Pastor Jason and Veronica, you have some of the best pastors on the planet. Would you give them a hand? So proud of all that God has done here. I remember the first time we met. Hey, I want to plant a church. I'm like, is there anything else you can do because it's going to kill you? Um, and he's done a phenomenal job. They've done a phenomenal job. And it's been an honor to be a part of it and be coaching him all these years and continue to see what God does. Hey, we're going to do something really fun here because uh, I think church should be the funnest place to be all week long. Don't you think so? Yeah. Come on now. So I want you to spread your hands like this. I know it's going to be awkward. It's all crowded in here. Go like this. Even if, if, hey, if you're single, this could work out for you. Um, <laughs> it's going to be a love connection. A Christian mingle. Okay, ready? Just go one time. Now hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. On the count of three, I want you to clap your hands. Ready? One, two, and three. All right, now this time when you clap your hands, however they naturally land, don't pull them back. Just however they land, just hold them there. Okay? Ready? One, two, and three. All right. Now, look down with me at your hands. Bring it in close like this. If your left thumb is over the right thumb, left thumb over the right thumb. Lift it high in the air like this, left thumb. You people are the best thinkers in the room. Yeah, oh no, you're the smartest people in the room. There's no doubt about it. Now, you're the best thinkers. How many had totally opposite right thumb over the left thumb? We'll lift it up in the air. Okay, you people are the best looking in the room. Ah. Woo. If your hand's not up, God's got someone for you. Just hang in there. Looks aren't everything. I don't know who came up with that idea, but um, left thumb over the right thumb, best thinkers. You got your best looking. How many had your thumbs come just together like that? Lift up to totally together. Lift up in the air. Several of you. You people think you're good looking. It's an ego thing for you. <laughs> now you can be seated. Zero spiritual value to that whatsoever. <laughs> but what the heck? Um, 
Awesome to be here. My name's Chris, uh, and uh, we've got multiple campuses, and the founder of that, and also the founder of uh, Church Boom, which Jason serves on the leadership team there. We serve churches all across the nation, helping them make them healthier and better. And uh, so lots of stuff going on. I've written several books. Some of them are out there. I'll talk about that later. Uh, been married for 30 years to a beautiful Hispanic woman. And oh, oh man. Oh no, no, she's hot. And uh, uh, I call her my little hot tamale. And uh, uh, then I, I got two amazing, two amazing children. And then we have this third one. No, I'm joking. I'm like, but we have... We have two amazing children, and uh, we have a son and a daughter. Our daughter got married a couple years ago, and 15 months ago, uh, she gave us a brand new first ever grandchild, and this is a picture of our granddaughter. Oh, look at that. I love you. Her name is Mila Brave, and I was holding her recently. It was so funny. I was holding her recently, and my adult son, he looks at me and goes, Dad, it's like you love her more. I go, no, it's not like I do. I do. I mean, Grandparents, you know what I'm talking about. Like, you had your run. It's over with. It was good while it lasted. You're a silver medalist from now on. So that's my little Mila Brave. You can take her off the screen there, my little baby. Hey, so Christmas is coming up. It's only six days away, and I'm sure most of you are ready for Christmas. You've bought those gifts. You've done those things. I love giving creative gifts. Uh, my wife always says I'm one of the most creative gift givers. I've done all sorts of things. But four years ago was the ultimate one. Uh, always right before Christmas, my wife will ask me, what did you get me for Christmas? She always said, what did you get me? And I said, oh, I already bought it. And she goes, you did? When did you buy it? She asked me. This is four years ago. I said, I actually bought it the day after Christmas last year. She goes, you bought my gift the day after Christmas last year. And then this is what she says. How much did it cost? No shallowness there at all. Um, and I told her $7. And she's like, and that's that's dead serious. And she goes, $7? I go, yeah, and I got it at Rite Aid. <laughs> I'm dead serious. I got her one gift. It was $7. I bought it at Rite Aid. Okay, so Christmas comes. She opens it up, and it's a journal. And she opens up to the first page, and she just starts to cry because it basically says on the first page, Laura, this is my gift to you. For the next 365 days, I will journal every single day on reasons why I love you. Now, here's what's happening right now. All the women are going, ah. All the men are going, jerk. Because whatever you got your wife, good luck Christmas morning. Because I just ruined it for you. Have you asked? Now, here's the funny part. She's crying. <laughs> she gets it. All the families look at you. 365. She reads it out loud. She runs over and hugs me. This is what she says. You're so consistent. I'm like, that's it? <laughs> Not you're hot, you're sexy, nothing, just you're consistent? That's all you got to say? But here's the thing. Have you ever bought a gift for someone, maybe a relative, spouse, kid, whatever, and you were so excited to give it to them? And you could not wait. And what are you waiting for? You're waiting for that moment that they open up their gift and they look at you. And maybe they don't say these words. But in their eyes, they say this. You did this for me? You're waiting. for. There is something inherent in, 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 in all of us that we want to serve other people. We want to put a smile on someone's face. We like buying the gift and then watching how they react. And like, you did that for me. There's something in all of us that want to see more uh, and, and, and serve more. And all of us, we live in the world where at some point we realize we don't want to just be successful. We want to be significant. We want to know that at the end of our life, when we come to an end and we're in heaven, that we know that people are here because of me, that I served, that I made a difference. The thing that I always say is, I think all of us in here have dreams and goals and ideas. Everybody in here has dreams and goals and ideas. There are books in here that have not yet been written. They're in your heart, but you haven't done it yet. There are songs that have not yet been composed, business ideas that could transform this church and many other churches around the world financially, but we don't do it. Why is it that we know that we are called to more, to do more of generosity, to do more with our time, talent, and resources, and treasures, to do all of that, 
What is it that keeps us from this is where God wants us to this is where we're at? And what happens is we let fear and doubt and insecurity and other people's opinion, we let all of that stuff get in the way from where we are to what we know God's called us to. So here's the goal. The goal this morning is, first of all, let's have a lot of energy. I want you to put a smile on your face. I'm three hours away. I had to drive three hours to get here, so I don't care how far you drove. I drove farther. So <laughs> smile, laugh, do whatever you got to do. Now, here's the thing. We are going to leave out of this room in a few minutes, and here's the choice we're going to make. We are going to choose to rob the grave. Too many people go to the grave with too many great ideas and too many concepts that they never did. They never lived out. How many, under all those sods of grass, can you imagine how many thousands of business ideas, how many thousands of books never got written, how many thousands of ideas that are laying there could have changed the world but didn't because we live under the umbrella of doubt and fear and insecurity. Too, mu too much of us, too many of us are born with a shout, but we end up with a whisper. And you're not meant to end up with a whisper. You are a child of God. You are a child. I don't care if you're new to this church. You're like, hey, I just rolled in here for the donuts, whatever. God loves you. God has a plan for your life. It's a matter of there where we are, but this is where we are right now. How do we get there? He loves you. He wants incredible plans for your life. He has more from your life, and you know it deep inside, and you know, I should try that. What if I did that in my neighborhood? What if I did that at the church? What if I came up with that idea to serve more, give more, do more, and we know we can get there, but the problem is we allow too much in there, and let me tell you something. There is a God who loves you. There's a God who cares about you. There's a God who wants the best for you. God did not make you to be average. I know some of us, I just live an average life. That is not what God called. God has called us to so much more than, than that. I don't know where we got the idea that average, it's not, because we don't serve an average God. Can you imagine the worship team up here just singing, how average is our God? <laughs> Sing with me, how average is our God? Oh God, you're so average. You're so beige. We love you. There's no way. That's not who God is. That's not how he created us. That's not what he wants us to be. There is a guy in the Bible named Gideon who lived in that average sort of world, if you will. He was a, a guy in, in the Bible that God had plans for his life, but yet he lived over here because of fear, doubt, and insecurity. Let me give you a little background on this guy named Gideon that we're going to jump into. Matter of fact, if you've got a Bible, go to Judges. If you don't have a Bible, next time at a hotel, get one. They're free there. They're amazing. I've got like 100 of them. It's a little side business I have. Um, steal them and sell them. Hey, I give it to the kingdom. All right, here we go. Israel is set free from slavery. If you ever know the story of Moses and all that, he sets them free from slavery. Everything's great. Israel slowly drifts away from the Lord, and so God removes his hand of blessing. God, thank you for delivering us. And now that you did, we're just going to kind of do our own thing. And God goes, okay, well then fine. I'll take my hand of blessing off your life if that's what you want. Third, Midianites. Those are the bad guys, by the way. They oppress Israel. They take away all their money. They take away all their stuff. They oppress Israel. God calls Gideon to fight for Israel. So the Israel people, they got delivered. Then all of a sudden, they're, uh, God kind of takes their hand off because they're going to do whatever they want. The Midianites are the bad guys. They come and they rob them. They kill them. They steal from them. God tells Gideon, one of the Israel people, he says, hey, dude, he goes, rise up, man. You got to do something. You got to help fight against these Midianites. And look what a, Gideon's response. He basically says, and we'll read it in a moment, but God, I'm not talented enough. God, I don't have what it takes. I'm not good enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not big enough. I am simply not enough. So what God does over the next story and, and, and conversation with Gideon is he transforms Gideon's way of thinking and believing so that he would go from where he is to where he needs to be. So for the next few minutes, we're just going to take the recipe that God gave Gideon and we're going to apply it to our life so that we can go from where we are to where God wants every one of us to be in the amazing things he wants to do in our life. So <clears throat> let's look at those things real quickly, if we could. Number one, here we go. What are the three things that God did for Gideon that he would do the same thing for us? Number one, he transformed his heart. We put more emphasis on past successes than we do on our current obedience. That's what, that's what happened to Gideon. Now let's take a look at it in, in Judges chapter 6, verse 6 through 10. 
So Israel was reduced to starvation by the Midianites, the bad guys. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. I told you, I am the Lord your God. Drop down to verse 10. You must not worship the God of uh, Amorites in whose land you now live, but you have not listened to me. So here's what he says. Okay, They're like, hey, God, we need your help. Midianites are killing us. <clears throat> and God's going, I told you that you needed to follow me. I told you you needed to keep your heart right with me. And he deals with Gideon's heart. Hey, Gideon, I know you still love me. I know that, you know that you're an okay guy, that you're not going around doing a bunch of stuff, but you're not letting me own your heart. You're not letting me own this right here, Gideon. That's the problem. And I think you and I might fall into that same category because you know what we have? We all have a, an invisible spiritual checklist. We all have it. Go to church, check. Give a little bit, check. Serve a little bit, check. And so we feel like, hey, man, I'm doing the Christian thing. And God's going, but wait a minute, Gideon. I want your heart. I want you to want everything I have for your life. You see, what I've learned about God is this. When you go all in, God goes all out. He does. And so he's, Gideon, I want you to go all in and then I'll go all out. Because you know what I've learned? If you let go of what is in your hand, God will let go of what's in his Woo, and what's in God's hand is a lot better than what's in ours. Like, here you go, God, then he goes, then here you go. And here you go, God, then here you go. It always works out better. Why people don't tithe is so crazy to me. It is unreal. If you're not a tither, I don't even go to the church, so if you can complain, you complain to Jason. That's the beauty of being a guest speaker. I don't get the emails. Tithing, giving, generous, trying out new dreams, new ideas, new goals that could change your life and change people's lives. Go all in with God and he will go all out. I'm telling you, it works. It always works. And that's what's happened with Gideon. I do a lot of flying. I travel about 40 out of 52 weeks, about 125,000 miles in the air every year. About four or five years ago, I got stuck at the Dallas airport. Uh, a friend of mine comes up to me, I, or see him up on distance, we give each other a hug. I'm like, dude, what are you doing here? I'm on a two-hour delay. Oh, so am I. He goes, hey, I'm going to go to the Admiral Lounge. I've been flying all this time, and I had no idea what the Admiral Lounge is. The Admiral Lounge is like a place for people that fly a lot. You can go into this private place. There's a restaurant. There's a little massage thing. There's a place where you can take showers. I mean, it is Unreal. And I've been over here hanging out with the commoners, and um, <clears throat> kids running around sneezing every which way, Big Macs flying around, you know, and you're just, it was a mess. And everybody, through these double doors, you go in, and it's like, ah, you know, it's just like this. Seriously, it opens up, it's like the gates of heaven open up, and you're like, wow, this is amazing. So he takes me in there. He laughed at me. I said, dude, I, I literally told him, I go, Admiral Lounge, I go, this is what I told my friend. I've been traveling all my life, and so has he. I said, man, I go, Admiral Lounge, I said, isn't that for the pilots? And he looks at me, he goes, what are you talking about? It's for the customers. It's for us, the people that fly a lot. He goes, what, what? So I go in there. They take his little whatever, and they check him in, and I'm his guest. They put my name in as the guest, and they go, oh, sir, you've been a, me, you've been a member for eight years. <laughs> I'm a what? And she goes, yeah, you've been a man for eight years. I've been hanging around with these snotty-nosed kids. French fries flying everywhere. And all I had to do was walk through the doors into something so much better. You have been a member of God's Admiral Lounge for years. And all he wants you to do is step through the doors and see what he does in your life. It's that heart that says, God, I am going all in with you. And then watch God go all out. Number two, look what he does. He deals with Gideon's mind. Our thoughts must shift from who we are to who we are in him. He changes his heart, but now get, he goes to Gideon, and he would go to us here at Discovery. He would say, okay, I want not only you to change your heart, I want you to change your mind. I want you to look at things different. The battle's always in the mind. It always is. I grew up, there's seven people in our house, and I grew up as the youngest of seven. And uh, we lived in a 1,000-square-foot home. 
seven of us. There was like people just stacked on top of each other, you know, and, and when food came out to eat, it was a free for all, you know, the, the, the strong ones live, the weak ones die. And so it's like a bloodbath when dinner came out and, uh, um, we didn't grow up in the nicest neighborhood. Matter of fact, it's not nice at all. It's really bad. And, uh, uh, and we did not grow up with a lot of money and all that. So <clears throat> grew up there. And I remember I was about 14, 15 years old, got invited to a youth group, ride my bike every day to the youth group, or, you know, or every week or whatever. It was like five, six, seven, eight miles away. I'd ride to it, ride back. I gave my life to Christ, kind of was doing it on my own, you know. And uh, my family wasn't serving God, but I wanted to. And I got invited to that youth group, blah, blah, blah. When I was 17 years old, just a few months before graduation, my dad looks at me and he goes, and we're standing in the hallway at 3481 Grant Street. And my dad looks at me and says, hey, son, he goes, what are you going to do when you graduate? I said, dad, <clears throat> I'm going to figure out how to go to Bible college. I don't have no money, but I'm going to figure it out. And I'm going to go be a pastor, and I'm going to travel, and I'm going to speak, and I'm going to start churches and write books and do all this stuff. I'll never forget what my dad told me in that hallway at 3481 Grant Street. He said, son, there's no way you'll ever make it. He said, you don't have what it takes. You are just not good enough. And that broke my heart. I went and sat in my room. Uh, it was a room with like nine of us, but, but there was no one in there. And I sat on the edge of the bed by myself, sat on the edge of the bed, no one in the room, started to cry a little bit, and God immediately got my attention. He goes, Chris, right here, right now, you need to make a decision. I literally had it in my head. I mean, God was speaking to my heart, no doubt, right there. He said, Chris, you got a decision to make right now, right now. You either listen to your earthly father or you listen to your heavenly father. You make the choice. You know what he was telling me? You can run in that pain for the next 20 or 30 years, or you can right now stop it and decide not to pick that up for your life. And I chose not to pick that up, and I chose to look at what God had to say about me and what God feels about me, and it's the same thing that I think that God was doing with Gideon and God does with each of us. Let's look at the verse, verse 7 through 9. Okay, it says this, Judges 6, let's pick it up. When they cried out to the Lord because of the Midian, the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites. He said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of slavery into Egypt. I rescued you from the Egyptians and from all who oppressed you. I drove out their enemies and gave you their land. What is, God, what is the Lord saying? I've done all of this. I've never let you down. I've made you better than you are. I've given you opportunity. You have seen how good I am. Why aren't you going all in? It was a mind shift. Gideon saw himself, we'll find out in a minute, as the weakest in all the clan. He says, I'm the weakest. I'm the most insecure. I'm, I'm fearful. I'm not the best looking. I'm not the talented. I don't have the degrees. I don't have all of that, God. And God's going, Gideon, but hold on. It's not who you are, it's who you are in me. And then all of a sudden, he begins to start seeing it because there's a change in his mind. The mind shift was happening to seeing himself one way to seeing himself the way that God saw him. It was a shift in the mind. Several years ago, I was speaking regularly at one of our campuses. We have uh, 13, we're launching 15, two more next year to make 15 campuses, and I was getting ready, the service was about to start, and I was sitting right over here, service was about to start yakking with some people, and a guy walks in and sits right here. Have you ever met anybody, it was about four or five years ago at one of our campuses, have you ever met anybody that um, just flat out, I know this is stereotyping, but have you ever met anybody that just flat out looks intimidating? Do you know what I'm talking about? They're the kind of, you know, you, you ever, come on, you've been late at night pumping gas, nobody's around, someone pulls out in their car, and they get out, and they just look intimidating. And what do you do? Yeah, $1.50 is enough. That's fine. Thank you. <laughs> Which today, that will get you two ounces. Um, so this guy was intimidating. So I get up. I go over. The service is about to start. I meet him. I go, hey, how you doing, man? He stands up. I'm not even kidding. He's like 6'2". He's tattooed up to like literally right here. It stops right here. He has dark sunglasses on. He's got uh, hair slicked straight back, jewelry, you know, the like, chain thing hanging down. He doesn't look like the godfather. He looks like the guy who would guard the godfather, <laughs> like the front guy, you know, and he's just like, I walk over, I go, how you doing, man? I go, my name's Chris. He looks at me, and I'm only like 5'11", and on my way down, and so he, <laughs> he looked at me, and he's like, he looks at me, he goes, my name's Glenn. He literally talks like that, and I'm like, okay, take the gun, leave the cannoli, you know, just like whatever. <laughs> I was scared to death. 
Pastor Jason, I kissed his ring finger. I was like, I got to do something. I thought he was going to kill me. Literally, I thought this guy's going to kill me. When I say, now I'm telling you, he wears sunglasses. He did not take them off. He never takes them off. Not for worship, not for the message. I baptize him with sunglasses on. <laughs> Name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. He comes up, <laughs> reek, 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 dries them off, you know. I'm like, dude. Anyway, so, he, you know, service goes on. I get up to speak, blah, blah, blah. I'm saying it's a big old audience, you know, and everybody's laughing. He's not doing one. He's not even laughing. He's just like this the whole time. And I'm like, he's going to kill me. And so... <laughs> Service, I get done with the message. We're going to do the offering at the end. The associate pastor comes up. He prays for the offering. I'm sitting right here. He's sitting over there. During the prayer and the offering, I don't shut my eyes. I got to be on alert. <laughs> so I look over at him, and he lifts up his pant leg. And I'm like, oh, he's got a gun. <laughs> he undoes a rubber band with the biggest grip of $100 bills I've ever seen. No less than ten grand on his ankle. And I'm looking over like, oh, my gosh. He undoes it, and he's counting it out, getting ready for the offering. And he's going like this. And I'm looking at him, and he, and he stops. And I look over at him, and I'm like. <laughs> You've done a lot wrong. You owe more than that. So he keeps coming to the church for the next couple months. After two months, he signs up. He wants to be in ministry. And I'm telling you, Pastor Jason, this is the gold ticket right here. Our offerings went through the roof when he became an usher. Because, <laughs> you know, he stands there with the bucket like. <laughs> People are throwing in money, credit cards, jewelry. <laughs> They're dumping their kids in there, Everything. Everybody's scared to death. It was so funny. After about three months, he comes up to me and goes, Pastor Chris, you know why I always sit? Now, he's been a Christian for 90 days, three months. He gave his life to Christ that first day. I said, hey, he goes up to me, hey, Pastor Chris. Glasses on still, of course. He says, you know why I sit in the front row every week? I said, no, I have no idea, Glenn. He goes, <clears throat> he goes if anybody tries anything on you, I'll take care of it. And I'm thinking in my mind, he wants someone to try something on me. <laughs> he hasn't been able to inflict pain in 90 days, so he's a little itchy. <laughs> I watched God change this guy's life, and it was amazing what God did. And he's still serving the Lord, still doing great. And, uh, yeah. <clears throat> I, I still haven't seen his eyes, uh, but... Um, <laughs> i tell you one thing, though, is uh, I noticed in my conversations with him, he just felt like, man, I've, I've done a lot wrong. I've done so much wrong, and I don't know if God can ever use me. And I just thought, man, it doesn't matter what we've done, where we've been, what degree we have, what degree we don't have, what we look like, what we don't look like, how smart we are, how smart we're not. It doesn't matter. In him, through him, and because of him, you and I are enough <laughs> for whatever he's got. And all I know is a little kid like me was 14 years old and started riding his bike to a youth group for a family didn't want to support him in serving Christ. And I went all in with Jesus, and he went all out for me. And, uh, and I'm telling you, it will work for you. Don't let fear get in your way. Don't let doubt get in your way. Don't let insecurity get in your way. And for goodness sakes, do not let other people's opinion get in the way of your dreams and goals that God has put in your heart. Here's what people will do. They will tear down your dream to a level that's comfortable for themselves. You know why they do that? Because your desire for excellence threatens their mediocrity. That's why they'll do it. They'll do it every time. Don't let that happen. Let's go to the third thing quickly. Here we go. Number three, God had to change his view. All that you have is more than all that you need, Gideon. He changed his heart. Gideon, I want all your heart. He changed his mind. Quit thinking like that. Quit thinking like that. You've got dreams, goals. I'm putting them inside of you. Use your time, talent, resources, and treasures for me. Come on, get in. And then he began to change his view, what he saw, what he could literally see, just like he did with Peter. Remember that? When he changed Peter's name from Simon to Peter, Peter just saw himself as nothing, the disciple Peter, but Jesus saw him as so much more. Do you know what the word Simon actually means? It's Simon. It actually means pebble. The word Peter means pebble. Petra, which means rock. Here's what Jesus is saying. Peter, you see yourself as a pebble, but I see you as a rock. 
It's the view. It's the view always, always changes. Now look what it says. We've got a bunch of scriptures here. Here we go. Verse 11. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree at Ophrah. Not Oprah. <laughs> that lady's got enough money. Doesn't need to be in the Bible also. Um, <laughs> which belonged to Joash of the clan and Abazar. Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. Gideon is hiding. He's afraid of the Midianites. And then the angel of the Lord comes and says to him, hey, mighty hero, when you're hiding in fear and the angel appears to you and says, mighty hero, that kind of is like, you can't be talking to me. I'm not that mighty. Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why all this happened to us and were all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites? He's like, Lord, you're not helping us. We're dying. The Midianites are killing us. This is not good. Then the Lord turned to him and said, go, help me out now, with the strength you have. Okay, now let's keep going real quick and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I'm sending you. But Lord, Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe, and I am the least. See what he sees about himself? You see that? I'm the least. And it says, the Lord said to him, I will be with you, and you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. Hold on. Here's Gideon. My clan, my group, my tribe, we're weak, and I am the least of even them. What did Jesus say before, or the Lord say before that? He says, Gideon, you already have what you need. You have what you need. We just read it in the verse. He says, the Lord told him, he says, you've already got it. He says, go with the strength you have. You already have. But Lord, I need, no, you don't. Let me tell you something. Your dreams, your goals, your pursuits, giving, sacrificing time, talent, and treasures to God, you have everything it needs for you, for God to take you and your life to that next level. The dream, the ministry idea, the concept, it's all inside of you. It's just a matter of it. letting get it out. you got to change that heart and say, God, I want all in. I do not want to get robbed of what you have for my life. i got to change my mind. Stop thinking of yourself as who you are, but who you are in him, and start seeing differently. I'm the weakest in all of it. And God's going, no, no, no. You have everything that is needed. you got it all. I, uh, um. I want to challenge you today. I don't know what you are or, or in, in sense of where you are in your life or what, what's happening. I just know that whether you're 14 years old in here or 85 years and old in here, God is not done with you. When you're done, you'll be dead. Until then, he's got a plan for your life. If you've got a pulse, he wants you to do something. And it's not a spiritual checklist. He was saying, come on, man, let's go. Let's do something. I've written some books that are out there. Um, grab them. I've written, hands, I've written several, but I just brought three today. In Search of Higher Ground. This is probably my most popular book called Quit Church. It doesn't mean to actually quit going. But I mean quit approaching God the way we do and go all in. And uh, it went number one on Amazon, number one on Reddit for like 10 minutes. But it was number one for a while. Uh, I, claim, I took a picture of it literally online. I was like, number one, that then back to 1,000. But it was there. <laughs> I had number one for like 10 minutes. It was amazing. I, uh, I think it's time for us to realize that, uh, and I encourage you to get those books. I really do, because I, I believe in investing in yourself and hopefully to rewire your thinking, because that's what we got to do. We are transformed by the renewing of our mind. Now, there are 3,000 promises in the Bible. Those are few that I, the, the few that I really like. I like when it says, I am crowned, I am blessed, I am highly favored. Do you know what those three have in common besides the phrase you are? Or you are blessed, you are crowned, you are highly favored. You know what they have in common besides the phrase you are? They're all written in the past tense. It's already done. Gideon's going, but Lord, I'm the weakest. You already have what it takes. It's already done. You just need to catch up to him and his way of thinking. That's all you need to do. I remember when uh, <clears throat> a few years ago, uh, we had this Christmas production at our church. If you've ever had a children's Christmas production, it doesn't matter what goes wrong. Everybody thinks it's cute. 
me or Jason mess up, it's like, well, you, you got to get more prepared. You got to listen to God. A kid messes up. It's like, oh, let's do it. He picks his nose. Oh, it's beautiful. Let's put it on. This kid, this, these, we, big Tristan production, a couple hundred kids are involved. It's a big old deal. And these three boys came up to me. They were eight years old. They came up to me, and they were so excited. So I'll pass it, Chris. They would tell me. Every week, they would tell me, we are the three kings in the play. And we get to wear a crown. I don't know why they wanted to wear a crown so bad, but they wanted to wear this crown. They're like, we're the three kings. <clears throat> we get to wear a crown. And then they got so used to telling me, they just walked by me at church. Yeah. Literally, they just give me sign language. They were so into it. I don't know why, but these three boys wanted to wear the crown. So the day of the, the, uh, the, day of the event comes, it's Christmas, whatever, and I'm in the front row just cheering on the whole, all the kids, and everybody's taking pictures and all that stuff. And it's time for the three kings to do their little dance. They get to do a dance. So the one kid opens up this box. It's a box they stand on to dance. He opens up the box, puts on his robe, you know, a little robe, and, and, and puts on a crown, jumps on his box, starts dancing. Next kid opens up the box, puts on his robe, puts on his crown, starts dancing. Next kid opens up his box, puts on his robe, and the crown's not in the box. This is all he's been talking about. This poor kid, you could, I, I, I don't know, anybody else caught I was in the front row, I'm like, oh, I know exactly the problem. Because he looked, and he looked around, and he shut the box, and he started walking around the stage. You know why the thing was going on. And, um... <clears throat> went outside, looked at his parents' car, come back. <laughs> He's walking around. He wants his crown so bad. Finally, he just goes, shuts the thing. Got a robe on, but no crown. The other kids, the other two kids do. And he starts dancing, and he's so depressed. <laughs> it broke my heart. I'm like, and he's like this. <clears throat> and out of nowhere, without anybody saying anything, the boy in the middle took off his crown and put it on his friend's head. And they just continued to dance together. <clears throat> I think of that moment and that story. And this is what I think. I think God would like to come to each one. There's a lot of people in here. One by one, put a crown on your head. Here's what I think of you. Here's what I think you could do. Here's what I see in your life. Here's what I think you could accomplish. And just start putting a crown on her head. And realize we already have what it takes. Our thoughts just need to catch up to his thoughts because he already got what it takes. In him, through him, and because of him, you're more than enough. Don't let anybody rob you of that. Decide today, today, I'm enough because of him. I'm the weakest in the clan. What did God say to Gideon? You already have what you need. It's already there just haven't tapped into it. I pray today that we would make a determination right now. We are not leaving this building until we rob the grave. Another book idea, another concept, another ministry idea, whatever God has for our time, talent, and treasures, we are not ever going to let the grave rob us. Decide to do that today. The kid from 3481 Grand Street who was told, you'll never make it can actually do something decent for the Lord? You can. But I am nothing special. I'm just a guy that was foolish enough or crazy enough to take up God on his word. And it works. It's going to work for you too. Maybe you're here today and you're new to this church. Maybe you came for the first time today. Maybe you've been coming for a while. But spiritually, as it pertains to Jesus, you don't really feel aligned with him. Maybe you've fallen away. Maybe you've never given Jesus a chance. Maybe you did at one point and you drifted. I don't know. But here at Discovery Church, you're, you are a major priority. We want to connect you to the life-changing Jesus. I want to give you an opportunity to say yes to him today. To give him a chance in your life and in your heart and watch what he'll do. Would you join me in prayer? God, first of all, we want to thank you that you've made us more than enough in you, through you, and because of you. We are enough. God, I pray everybody in this room right now, with your eyes closed, that you would just take a moment and say, Lord, take all of my heart. Would you do that? All of my life. My time, talent, and treasures belong to you. 
I'm going to pursue my dreams, goals, and things you put in my heart. Maybe you're here and you're in that place where it's like, man, if my life was to be taken today in some horrible tragedy, I don't know if I'm ready to meet Jesus. That would sure be a bummer. Let's fix that right now. If you're not where you should be with Jesus, I'd like to pray for you. If that's you, would you just quietly just slip up your hand way high in the air so I can see it? Put it right back down. I'm just not where I should be with Jesus, but I want to get there. Thank you all over this room. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow. Anybody else? Thank you. All over this room. Thank you. Yeah. Now I'm going to lead you in a prayer. It's a prayer of just making things right with Jesus. It's a commitment prayer, covenant prayer. We're all going to pray it with you. You know why? Because we're with you on this decision. And we stand with you. You're not alone on a spiritual journey. We're with you. So would you join me in prayer and say this prayer after me as accepting Christ into your life. Let's all pray it together. Say it out loud. Say, Jesus, today I give you my life. My heart is all yours. Wash me clean. I've made plenty of mistakes. I make a covenant today, a commitment for the rest of my life. I will follow you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys, there are some people.